Hi, uh, I'm Shannon Woods, Springfield, Missouri. Uh, I had a question uh, about balancing the, the role of autonomy for the patient to make decisions on accepting what risks they personally have with uh, the, the obligation as a team physician to a professional organization or a university who expects you to protect them from potential legal pitfalls. How do you balance that uh, as a physician and try and do the right thing for your patient and serve your role to the universities? Uh, I'll say my comment and I'll, I'll have other people also. Um, so for me, it's sort of easy because I'm not a team physician. Um, so I can give my recommendation uh, and whether the team physician in the university follows it is another uh, uh, issue. But for me, um, I give my opinion and hopefully people listen to it. So I, I think it's a great question. And uh, Paul Thompson actually brings this up a lot when, at, at meetings uh, with, with, with regards to your role. Who are you working for? Um, before I take any of those positions, I usually have that conversation with whoever I'm being employed by. And I will tell them that I'm going to do the right thing whether you're comfortable with it or not. So I, I try and give my opinion and um, so far I can tell you that the, the, the professional teams that I've worked for and, and all of soccer has, has basically said take care of the athlete and you're taking care of the league. So I've never had that as an issue for me up till now. Part of that maybe is because I've had that discussion up front. Uh, but that phrase is specific to me from the CMO of uh, soccer who said, take care of the athletes and you'll take care of the league. That's all I need you to do. So I usually, I have to sleep at night too and I try and do the right thing that I'm comfortable with. And if they're unhappy with it, that, that's on them to make that decision. That's how I do it. So I think uh, you bring up a really good point. As a, as a team physician, I think you have to take in all the different perspectives, including uh, the university perspective and, and what happens when uh, the athlete from the university side, if they have an event, um, maybe in a televised scenario, for example, what does that do to the, the university and, and uh, to their reputation? And, and so you are caring for the athlete, but you sort of have all these different factors, and it's not easy as a team physician. Um, I think last night I was asking Sanjay how he, um, how he uh, sort of approach this and he talked about having uh, lawyers from both sides at the table um, really thinking about what that conversation is like from the athlete side from the institution side and uh, again it's not an easy conversation and uh, I do think it's probably different from a cardiologist perspective versus a team physician perspective. But I, like what you, I like what you said bringing it up up front and having that discussion is important I usually meet with them face to face I'll say mom and dad both got to be there the, co the collegiate athletes that I've cleared to play with a variety of stuff uh, that may have been on the fringe, I want them all at the table, and, and then the, the university gets to decide. Ultimately, I, I can't predict their risk. I would just add to that that, you know, as a sports medicine physician, we may be a little closer to the university or our professional team, but our first priority undoubtedly is, is what is the best care for the patient, and that is our, that, that, that should lead our priority. I think that it it may flavor our recommendation a little bit when we put it all into consideration, but ultimately it's what you think is best for the athlete, and that needs to come out in your recommendations for the athlete uh, and the family so they understand that. And then ultimately the university and the or the professional sports organization may choose to go a different direction. You know, the, the, the consulting team and the team physician may be okay with an athlete playing, and the professional team might say, you know what, I don't want any risk that they're going to have an event in public view in front of millions of people and we're not going to let them play. So I think as a team physician, your role is still first with the, with the athlete for sure. Thanks, Irv. That was interesting. Uh, and one of the things I found really interesting is that kids with false positives weren't anxious or were not significantly anxious. And I, what that says to me is they didn't really know what was going on. Um, which I think is actually fine. I think that's actually was a real good take home point is that when you're screening for something where you recognize that despite your best efforts, you're still probably gonna have more false positives than true positives. There's probably some argument for trying not to walk too far down the road that you're afraid of in front of them because they don't actually know what's going on. And until you have more information, I think that's probably not a bad thing. So I, I, I'm just a little curious about your response to that. And then I had a quick question about cardiac MRI. Is there any, is this purely now just a cost issue? In other words, is there any reason to, 
if you could just go straight to MRI, is there any reason to get an echo at all? And it, are we just in that evolution? Is this the tomogram, you know, of orthopedics where this echo is just going to be gone in five or ten years? I'm just curious. It's a good question. Yeah. So, yeah, I'll go, I'll go first. Uh, the, I think that your point is, is really important that at the high school level, they, they may not exactly comprehend what's going on. There is the caveat, as I said, in the, the high school screening, we had echo on site versus in the uh, college screening, we let it play out like a real world, real world scenario. Um, so they received the ECG if they had uh, an abnormal ECG and needed the echo, that could have taken uh, a day or two or however long it took at the, at the collegiate level to get the echo. And so whether there was anxiety related to the, the length of time, uh, we weren't able to tease that specific point out. But I think at the collegiate level, I do think people start to understand a little bit more uh, they're hearing about it. The risk for um, cardiac arrest or death is higher, in, in, especially in certain sports. So I think that does play a role. But at the high school level, they may not really understand um, what's occurring. And, and I do think it's important for us to not portray any sort of concern because um, we might raise anxiety. We don't do it when we do history and physical, for example, right? Um, and maybe that's because we don't have any, any faith in the test. So uh, the, uh, it's a great question about whether or not we should just do MRIs across the board, skip the interim. And I would suggest that you didn't, that um, there is a specific test depending on your question, and then a lot of it has to do with your local expertise. So he or she who interprets the electrocardiogram, the echocardiogram, or the MRI will determine the value of that reading. And a lot of them come that are woefully inadequate, both echocardiograms and MRIs, that I have to then repeat, and, and there's a layering of that. So the, the take home for me is that know who you have locally for expertise and who can help you uh, answer the question appropriately and then know what that is. So it might be always a cardiac CT to look at anomalous coronary arteries. Your, your local person may not be able to do the MRI for that. Um, and then if you can't, then the, your ego has to be small enough to refer out. You have to be able to say, I need help. And I told Mike Ackerman this yesterday, whenever I hear him talk about long QT syndrome, I'm reminded of how woefully inadequate my knowledge is with long QT. But I do a pretty good job, and then all of a sudden he goes to the next level and the next, and I think, boy, I gotta do some more reading on the way home. So <laughs> I, uh, hopefully that answers your question that I, I don't think you can skip any of them, that it depends on the question you're asking, and that your local expertise will determine which, which is your next best test. Uh, just from a housekeeping issue, um, we're going to get through these four questions and then we'll uh, split after that. Joe? Irv, that was a, a great presentation and, and a topic that's easily overlooked when we do screening and get uh, wrapped up in the operations and ECG interpretation and then it's easy to overlook this psychological aspect of the, particularly the students or athletes who have issues. And these are the most difficult conversations I have with them in 35 years of practicing. It's really tough to do that. But my question is this issue of refocusing. And so when I look at a student athlete and I say, uh, you know, you maybe ought to look into something, I get that look from them like, you don't know squat, you don't understand anything. So do you employ, uh, engage their coach, someone that they respect from the athletic standpoint to help them with this, and, and how do you go about that? Because as a physician, I'm just not equipped to do that. They're not, I don't have the credibility, I don't think, with them. So there are two things I think you, you alluded to, to one. I think the, the first is it's going to take time to get to that refocus. So that's where the multiple conversations come in. Um, and building that trust if you don't have it. Um, I think what's fortunate in me having the family medicine uh, background and me being able to follow up with patients, I guess I have that ability to build a relationship and over time maybe that um, does something for, for the patient. And then the second is thinking about the entire support network. So uh, coaches, friends, family, uh, mental health counselors, um, athletic trainers, whoever that might be, sort of building that whole uh, support network and then over time uh, they'll probably build a bridge with somebody. Um, maybe you can connect them with somebody else who's been diagnosed with the disease. So that's where the uh, Connected by Hearts program may be important. Um, but it does take time, and I think that um, people will find that there's something else that they might be good at, such as mentoring or coaching, playing uh, uh, instruments. That's another one that we found in, in people. So this is just maybe some suggestions. So I'm involved in uh, military aspects of this thing. So all the people who are student athletes just consider them with a uniform on, uh, same kind of thing. 
and w they haven't had any EKGs in the past, and now we're hoping that it's coming in the future. And all the issues that were uh, raised uh, this morning, my concern is uh, if, if you're a physician and you've got two trailers, one of them's got the Seattle criteria and the other has only an EKG, uh, how are you going to feel about the outcome of, of defining a test? Because you're going to have false negatives and all kinds of stuff going on in that situation. Make any I'm sense. Yeah, sorry, so can you just uh, explain in a little bit more there what you mean? Well, it, your only tool that you're going to be allowed because the military is very restri restrictive is an EKG, period. Mm -hmm. No echoes, no, no other follow ons, no genetic testing. Uh, we're going to be fighting you know, to go as far as we need to go for the best coverage. So let's say the, the international criteria. You can't. Uh, I'll, yeah. I'll just say that you know you can't initiate an ECG program without having the resources to do the proper follow-up. Totally and so, yeah. uh, I think as much as ECG may identify some disorders as the gold standard, might identify long QT perhaps or, or pre excitation. Even those need additional workup and management. So, uh, I think that part of the package the military needs to consider is not just getting a good ECG device or using the right criteria, but un un having a whole program with the resources and the specialists available to do the proper evaluations afterwards. Okay, it has yeah. to be hand in hand. Yeah. So, I think the, the military opens up a whole other issue. Mm -hmm. I've seen a number of the of folks from there. And uh, because they are owned 24-7, there is no off time for them. It becomes a really a big challenge with regards to how you handle genetic testing. None of that can be hidden. So if you, if you, if you identify it, the military gets it whether you want it or not, which is different <laughs> than everybody else. So I couldn't agree more that if you're not going to do it comprehensive, then it can't really be done. Uh, thank you for your comments on the MRI and follow-up, and I'd be more confident in ordering it. Um, the, the problem for me is a lot of these kids come from out of state and I can't order them so I have to go to the primary. But Aaron Bar Bagish had a great idea. He said before they even leave home for the season, you contact the primary and say they are to order it there and hope that they do a decent MRI and follow up. The other one question is MRIs and people who have like slow heart rates but very irregular from all ectopic beats, do you get a decent um, interpretation with that? Sure. So slow or fast heart rates well, are not a I have someone that has a heart rate of 30, but he has so much escape rhythm that it's just ridiculous. You look at the EKG and it's just very irregular. Yeah, so it shouldn't be a problem. It, it will be technically more challenging because of the way they, the MRI is collected, it does pieces of each R to R interval. So it'll take a longer time. The breath holds could be a little bit longer, but there are ways you can, you can adjust the, the MRI setting so that you get smaller pieces so it's a little more tolerable for that individual. Uh, the faster the heart rate, as long as it's regular, it's always doable. In fact, the MRI can be done even faster, so we never mind, as, we never mind a, a heart rate of, of 95 or 100 if they're nervous or, or whatnot. The slower ones are a little more challenging. If you're in atrial fib, we used to say the arrhythmias were a really big challenge and that it would make it impossible because of the triggering. Mm -hmm. But now they have things called MR echo, which are sort of free breathing sequences, so that they can be breathing the entire time, and you get... Uh, sort of an echo look to the MRI, but, but with a little uh, better contrast resolution. So again, the measurements are, are better. So depending on the expertise locally, that should not be difficult to do. Um, but I feel your pain on the out-of-state issue. It is definitely challenging uh, with you know them coming with CDs from other places. Will they play or not? Did they send you a brain MRI instead of the heart MRI? <laughs> you know, we, we, we were laughing last night. That was a story. We were all joking. You know, like this is a great knee, but I really need to know what the head, what, what the heart looks like. Um, so, the, the challenges are definitely there when, when they're out of state. But with regards to arrhythmias, easily overcome with some expertise. Thank you very much. Last question, Jim. Hi, Jim Chester from <clears throat> Oregon Health Sciences. Uh, a couple of questions. One, uh, we run into a couple issues where we've had screening programs come in and haven't coordinated with a sports medicine team, like the team physicians at all. And I was wondering if you could comment how you logistically go about that. And then the other issue is when the athlete actually has a positive ECG, I mean, it, wherever you find that, I would assume at that point they're disqualified until they have further workup. And I was wondering if you could just comment on how you go about that and what's the average time you would suspect, except where you have the 
uh, echo locally that the athlete uh, is disqualified, you know, just kind of an average scenario, and maybe how much it costs to, uh, to perform that second level testing. So uh, first question again, you were, you're asking about coordination between right. um, a school and the team physician? Right, because some schools are approached by a program at, the, let's say, the um, school secretary level and said we want to do screenings, and then a screening occurs kind of a peripheral level to the sports program, and oftentimes it's even done in season, say at ba during a basketball season, athletes are found to have positivity, but then they're sent off to get further testing. Mm -hmm. As the team physicians, sometimes we're concerned that that athlete should be disqualified until they get the further testing, or at least should be coordinated with a team physician. And I'm just wondering if you know you see maybe some comments about that. I yeah, um, oh, good. I, I was going to say, um, first of all, um, I'm very cautious or hesitant to to accept external programs to come in and screen because they don't offer the comprehensive package, and I, I worry that. They're doing screening, identifying ECG abnormalities, and then leaving, and, and don't have access to the primary care physicians or the consulting docs that really need to follow that person, order the right uh, uh, secondary investigations, et cetera. So they may provide a service in, in terms of the ECG and interpretation, but, but, but that, that's not enough to do ECG screening. You need, you need the comprehensive program. Um, we had a little bit of this discussion yesterday, I think, in our workshop, in that over time, when we had the Seattle criteria in the red box, were a mix of what I would consider more major abnormalities and minor abnormalities, meaning we had infralateral TV of inversion and left axis deviation sort of meaning the same thing, and they really don't, meaning that back then I wondered, do we really need to have temporary restriction, is the word that I use, uh, while we get that evaluation. I think now in 2017 with international criteria, if they really have a red box finding, there, there are no sort of minor red box findings. Those minor ones are in the yellow box for, for reason. So if they really have a red box finding, I think that uh, you're justified to, to do temporary restriction, get the full evaluation, and then return them to play, or, 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 or other words. In our NCA study that had 35 institutions, the average time between ECG abnormality and return to play was two days. So, so, so typically it's not a, uh, an enormous burden to get but, them back but at the, the collegiate the, level. It sounds like you're recommending that if the screening program is done, that that be coordinated with the athletic program so that, that they get the re immediate results if somebody's flagged so that person doesn't play until they're screened? Absolutely. Right. You want, I, I think right. as a team physician, you'd want that information right. and then you'd want to drive that work up, expedite it, et cetera. But I think once, uh, even if you didn't want the information, once it's in your lap, I think you have to handle it. Right. Thank you. Yeah, I think you have to have the appropriate infrastructure in place, and that's that's one element of it. But uh, certainly, having a, uh, what you do with follow-up testing, who uh, who gets it, who gets referred, what's the next step, all those things need to be in place before you have a, a screening program. Most of the colleges, all of the colleges locally that I work with, uh, have my cell phone number. When something becomes abnormal, I get a phone call. Sometimes a text with the electrocardiogram on it. And I can almost always see them within 48 hours, except when I'm out here. But th there are, uh, they can usually be seen very quickly because our goal shouldn't to be to keep them off the field, right? It should be to get them back on the field. And I think if we don't keep that in mind, the athletes will start doing these fewer and fewer. They will rebel because they don't want to come off the field, right? They're bulletproof like I was uh, until I got uh, less bulletproof. Perfect. Well, that was a thank you very much, panel and speakers. This is a great morning. Um, I, I want to comment that we are right on time. Um, feedback yesterday from our, our breakout sessions was that they could be slightly shorter. So um, rather than an hour for our breakout, we have 40 minutes. I think that's perfect. Um, this room will be uh, a presentation on advanced ECG interpretation that I'm going to give. In the Ballard Ballroom are some uh, sports cardiology cases that uh, Jordan Prockin and Dave Owens are going to walk through. Um, and then we will get back on track um, with our break at 1010 and then return here for, for Aaron Baggish's keynote uh, at 1030. So thank you.